very presence encouraging way that, that, that we do. So it is a way of encouraging uh, one another. Scripture teaches that when we come together to worship, we do so on the basis of God's word and, and the protocols that he establishes in his word. And that means that we are to worship by means of God the Holy Spirit and by means of truth. We worship by means of the Holy Spirit because in the Christian life, in the church age, the Christian life is, is empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit. We are uh, exhorted to walk by means of the Spirit, to be filled by means of the Spirit, to walk in truth, to walk in light, all of which uh, refers to the same basic dynamic of being in fellowship and enjoying that fellowship with God as we grow and mature. When we sin, we're living in the power of the sin nature, and as a result of that, the, anything that we do has only temporal value. It has no eternal spiritual value. So whenever we do sin, we're out of fellowship. We need to make sure that we are in fellowship, and we do that by confessing sin to God. So we always begin with a few moments of silent prayer to give everyone the opportunity to make sure that they're in fellowship, and then I'll open in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we rejoice that we're able to gather together this morning to worship you in freedom because of the uh, character of our founding fathers formed, shaped by your word, that we have a legal document that establishes freedom in this nation for worship without interference from federal authorities, and we're able to gather together and freely proclaim your word. And it is on the basis of your word that we come to understand life as it is, we understand the world as it is, and how we are to live in a way that honors and glorifies you. Most importantly, we learn of our great salvation, the entire plan of salvation from its inception with the death of Christ on the cross and the payment for sin and our entry into the family of God by faith alone in his substitutionary spiritual death on the cross all the way to our ultimate glorification when we are absent from the body and face to face with you. Father, we pray that during this life as Christians that we might uh, not lose heart, that we might press on and endure, uh, facing the difficulties, the challenges that we have in this life, living in a fallen, corrupt world, learning how to live in obedience to you and to glorify you, and that we might continue to rejoice because we have our focus set upon you. And now, Father, we pray that as we focus upon you this morning, that we might honor and glorify you in all that we say and do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together for our uh, opening hymn, number 267, Come Thou Almighty King, hymn number 267. Please stand.
scripture reading this morning is in Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12, so you can turn there and read along with me as I read verses 1 through 16. Proverbs chapter 12. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. Notice the antithetical parallelism here. You have a positive statement and then a contrastive statement following it. And that's true for most of the Proverbs in the uh, main part of, uh, of Proverbs, from Proverbs 10 to 22. A man is not established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous cannot be moved. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked are, lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. A man will be commended according to his wisdom, but he who is of a perverse heart will be despised. Better is the one who is slighted but has a servant than he who honors himself but lacks bread. A righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, But he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. The wicked covet the catch of evil men, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. A fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. Let's stand together for our second hymn, a focus and a reflection upon the attributes of God, specifically his power and his omnipotence. Number 33, God the Omnipotent. Hymn number 33, please stand.
God's grace is always abundant toward us. Scripture teaches that in his gift of salvation, he has not only given us a redemption from sin, forgiveness for sins, but he has, at the time of our salvation, given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. God is a source of every good thing and every blessing in our lives. And as part of our responsibility as believers, we are to use some of that bounty that God has given us to support his work uh, through the local church as well as through missions. This is the worship of giving. Giving is not mandated in Scripture in terms of certain percentages, but is to be based upon an individual's own uh, responsibility before the Lord, his own degree of appreciation for God's grace, and a determination to be generous and gracious in response to God's grace in our lives. Scripture says, As every man purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a generous, grace-oriented giver. As the men come forward to take up the offering, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for all that you've given us and supplied for us and for this congregation and the many ways in which you bless and prosper us. And Father, we give these gifts as a token of our appreciation in response to your goodness and grace in our lives. And we pray that these might be used for the furtherance of the teaching of your word both here and abroad. And we ask that, pray that it will glorify you in the way it is used. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, we're dismissing the kids to go back to their classes in prep school. This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not 
is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of the word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, at this point we come together to submit ourselves to your word that you have revealed yourself to us, you have revealed to us in your word who we are. We come to understand our flaws, our failures, and we come to understand your grace, that you have provided the perfect solution for sin, and you have given us instruction in your word as to how we are to uh, deal with sin in our life, not just in terms of faith in Christ for salvation, but in terms of our ongoing spiritual growth after salvation. Father, we need to be challenged by your word because so often we become complacent, so often we are in self-deception due to the nature of our own sin nature, and too often we fail to uh, push ourselves forward in terms of spiritual growth. We pray that as we study your word today that Again, we will be reminded of our responsibilities and the challenges presented in your word and recognize that we can't do this on our own, that we can only do it under the power and filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, it is our responsibility to engage our volition in these difficult decisions to do that which is right. Father, we pray that you would illuminate your word clearly to us through the Holy Spirit today. In Christ's name, amen. We live in a world, the devil's world, and the devil's world is a world characterized by arrogance and deception. And it should not be any surprise to us when we look at the way the politicians and the leaders of the devil's world uh, deal with the problems and things that are surrounding us. In the last 15 or 20 years, we've come used to the hyperbole of politicians always speaking about what I believe are pseudo-crises. We have a health care crisis. We do, but it's not the one they identify. Uh, It's because of their solutions, we're destroying our entire health care industry. We have a global warming crisis, a climate crisis. It's, not, it's a climate crisis. It's not the one they identify because global warming is just another hoax based on the fraudulent uh, hypotheses of scientists that for the most part are operating on evolutionary presuppositions in relation to their interpretation of meteorological phenomena. We have an uh, economic crisis. We have a crisis in the Middle East. I can go on and on and on. And we have all these crises that politicians want to uh, focus on and emphasize so that they can just reach their hands further and further into our pockets to take more and more of our money. So there's always one new crisis after another. And the, unfortunately, they're all pseudo-crises. The real crises are crises that are foundational and fundamental and are the real threat to our whole civilization and way of life. And one of those is a character crisis. It's no new thing for politicians and business leaders and others to succumb to the baser drives of their sin nature and to get involved in everything from... Uh, sexually immoral affairs to uh, uh, financial uh, mismanagement and embezzlement and things of that nature. Because we're all sinners, we all have this problem with an internal enemy known in Scripture as the, as the sin nature, the flesh, and that when people do not 
uh, have the spiritual tools or are not willing to use the spiritual tools to master and control their sin nature, and they yield to the drives and the lust patterns of their sin nature, then these are the things that are going to manifest. But when a culture is in spiritual ascendancy, as Western civilization was for many centuries, and as especially uh, the English-speaking peoples were over the last 300 years, you see less and less of the manifestation of these kinds of scandals and problems. They're still there. It's no perfect society. We can't make a perfect society, but those things are, are still there. But once you get into spiritual revolt, and Western civilization has been in one form or another of spiritual revolt for approximately 200 years with the influence of, uh, of rationalism and empiricism via the, the consequence of the Enlightenment and uh, 19th century liberal th- uh, skepticism and liberal theology, uh, we're seeing the poisonous fruit of that way of thinking manifest itself in the character of the nation, which is simply a manifestation of the character of the people in the nation. And we're living at a time where, there, where we have a serious and significant character crisis. And what makes this character crisis so bad is that many, many people, not just atheists, secularists, humanists, liberals, but many conservatives, many Christians, many evangelical Christians have compromised so much in terms of their ethical values that they seek to somehow uh, gloss over the uh, serious consequences of sinful behavior. Just look at what has happened recently in the whole debate over uh, same-sex marriage and, and the legitimization of sodomy. Now, on one hand, many Christians have gone way too far in trying to treat homosexuality as some sort of extreme, perverse, it is perverse, uh, sin that is somehow worse than any other sin. Now, it may be worse in some of its consequences, but it's always listed in Scripture with numerous other sins, sins of the tongue, mental attitude sins, other sins of sexual immorality, whether it is uh, in terms of uh, sexual infidelity, marital infidelity, whether it's in terms of, uh, of sex outside of marriage, heterosexual sexual relations outside of marriage. All of these things are evil and destructive to a culture, uh, all the sexual and and sins of immorality, because they attack two of the foundational uh, institutions that are designed by God to provide stability to any culture in any nation, and that's marriage and the family. And so that's why, in the terms of the the issue of homosexual marriage, this is, is bad. But it's not an uh, it's not a unique sin that is somehow the unforgivable sin. Uh, you know, I always liked what Charlie Clough used to say when he uh, when he would be evaluated in, in when he was working for the government, and they would say, "Well, you know," and people would know he was a Christian. Well, do you have any problems working with a homosexual? He said, "Well, I have any trouble trouble working with liars and lazy people and irresponsible people and adulterers. Why should I have trouble, uh, an extra amount of trouble working with homosexual perverts?" There's not just a whole lot you can say to that because you're not isolating the homosexual community as some sort of unique category. And uh, and that's just one thing that has happened. But today we see conservatives, political conservatives, and we see Christian conservatives somehow wanting to uh, ameliorate the issue, somehow glossing over it, somehow trying to validate uh, and uh, the homosexual lifestyle. That's just one example. And we have more and more examples, and I don't want to uh, distract you too much this morning, of politicians and businessmen and pastors who have gotten involved in 
uh, uh, various sins of, uh, related to sexual immorality and character flaws. And we have this crisis in our, in our country today. We see everyone from the President of the United States to those who are presidents and CEOs of corporations down to the everyday uh, janitor and worker who believes that uh, his ethical standards can vary from day to day. They're, they're based on pure, pure relativism and that uh, they often lie. One of the major problems corporations have is employees who steal from the corporation. You have uh, employees in retail establishment who think that they just have the right to take whatever it is that they're selling home f- without purchasing it. Uh, you have people who are uh, taking cl- or claiming uh, credit for someone else's work. They lie about their own credentials. They lie to customers. They lie on their resumes and misrepresent what they've done. They, uh, <clears throat> they misrepresent their expenses on expense reports. And the list goes on and on and on. And it, in many cases, these things are just normal. They have become accepted as normative practice in many subcultures in this country. And the problem is is that we have a uh, nation now that has lost its moral compass and people don't emphasize or understand character. The writer of Proverbs is emphasizing character as part of many things that are emphasized in, in in, in, in this book. We've looked at things such as diligence, hard work, versus laziness and irresponsibility. Uh, Last week I looked at righteousness versus wickedness. And this morning I want to look at this issue of character, both the bad, that bad forms of character prohibited and warned against in Proverbs, as well as the positive character, and just help us think a little bit about the importance of, of developing good character. Now, to begin this, I think it's helpful to go back to a diagram familiar to most of you here, and one that I think has great value for understanding what has been called traditionally biblical psychology, a biblical understanding of the immaterial nature of man. Now, there's a difference between biblical psychology and humanistic psychology. Biblical psychology is a a study of what the Bible teaches about the nature of man as a fallen creature and as a sinner, the makeup of man as being composed of a physical body, a soul which is comprised of his mentality, uh, his volition, his conscience, his self-consciousness, and of his human spirit for a regenerate person, and the human spirit is that immaterial element of his nature that enables the elements of the soul to have a relationship with God. But the enemy of the spiritual life, the enemy of every human being, is really the sin nature. And it's we've portrayed this with a black diamond because the Uh, the blackness of sin, using the uh, imagery there. And at the very core, the Scripture teaches that our sin nature, our our desires, the drives in our life, and and even humanistic psychologists realize that we have uh, certain needs and certain drives. It's that they pervert that and they put that within a false framework. That's always why you have to be careful when you're reading in any form of of humanistic psychology, there's going to be some truth there, but it's not any different from the truth that a stopped watch is right, right twice a day. They live in God's world, God's creation, rather. They live in a world created by God, and certain things they must recognize and must admit to be true. But how they interpret it and fit it within their framework for understanding life is where it gets all confused. Same verbiage, same terminology sometimes, but it's put within a uh, false framework. 
At the core of the sin nature, we have these lust patterns. The Bible talks about all kinds of different lusts. Normally, when we use the term lust, people automatically jump to sexual lust, but there's different kinds of lust. We lust for power. We lust for prestige and recognition. Uh, We lust for uh, different material things. We lust for money and the things that money can buy. And it's those lusts that sort of drive things. But the basic orientation of lust is all about me. And it's all about me. And you may think it's all about you, but I'm here to tell you you're wrong. It's not about you. It's about me. And every one of us believes that. That's the orientation of our sin nature, and we understand that scripturally. You just go back and read through Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, where Lucifer, and uh, we have the, the reflection of Lucifer's initial sin expressed through five I wills. It's that I that is at the center and foundation of all sin and the sin nature. <coughs> The lust patterns all have an an arrogant disposition. Now, in arrogance, it's all about the self. We have self-absorption, and we all, from the time we're born and we come out of the womb, we are focused on what's going to make me feel better. And whether it's food at the very beginning or sleep at the very beginning or whether it's more sophisticated things that we uh, develop a taste for as we go through life, it's all about making me feel good and making me feel happy. And that in its worst forms becomes what is known as narcissism. And we live in a narcissistic culture, a culture that feeds and provides a rationale to justify that. And so whenever we have self-absorption, it always leads to self-justification. Self-justification isn't based on truth. It's based on deception. Self-justification leads to self-deception, and self-deception leads to a complete... Uh, a a complete self-worship, self-deification. And so we have this lust pattern that drives us us forward. Now, there are two ways in which lust can manifest themselves, and we talk about these in terms of human good and personal sins. Now, human good is a difficult concept. If you've ever tried to talk to people and use the term human good, that's a tough thing for a lot of people to comprehend, especially unbelievers. The best example I've seen is that of the Pharisees in the Bible. They're doing everything right. We tend to look at them through that grid of hypocrisy as they're challenging Jesus. They reject his Messiahship. But the fact is that if you were going to... uh, portray someone who was doing everything right ethically, morally, that emphasized all of the great values of character, uh, it would be a Pharisee. That's why Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. He's not saying, well, you know, those guys are just a bunch of hypocrite hypocrite liars. They they were that, but so is everybody else. Uh, He's saying, you know, externally, they look like they're doing it better than anybody else. And you've got to, your righteousness has to be better than that. People are sitting there going, well, I can't be as good as a Pharisee. How in the world am I ever going to have the kind of righteousness God expects? And that was the whole point, is that all of our righteousness, Scripture says, is as filthy rags. It's never good enough to to acquire God's favor. Righteousness, the kind of righteousness God requires, can only be ours if it's given to us by God. That's called imputation in the Scriptures. And it's given to us or imputed to us at the instant of faith alone in Christ alone. But while the unbeliever and the believer out of fellowship uh, cannot produce that quality of righteousness, we can live a moral and ethical life. Just look at a lot of the uh, religious groups or relig- and religious cults that are out there that emphasize a works-based salvation. You have people like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and, and many others, but those are the ones we're familiar with in the U.S., And they live very moral lives. They seem to emphasize family values above many other things. And I've told the story before how when I was in seminary, I did some house-sitting, and there was one family I did a lot of house-sitting for when they were out of town. 
And yeah. one time uh, they told me that whenever they were doing any kind of work on the house, any kind of renovation or anything of that nature, they needed good craftsmen, carpenters, electricians, plumbers. They always hired a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness because they were working their way to heaven, and so they did a better quality work than just a Christian. And that's a problem because some Christians are so grace-oriented, they just do sloppy work. You know, God's going to forgive them anyway, so they're a little bit licentious, and it affects their, their quality of work. But the, the unbeliever can live a good life. It's just not good with a capital G. It's just a relative good life. So they can have a measure of character. Now, the reason I bring this in is because uh, many of you are parents or grandparents, and you have children, young children, that may not be believers yet because they're too young, and you need to instill in those children good character. You need to teach them moral and ethical values. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the spiritual life, but it means that's the foundation for teaching the spiritual values and spiritual character traits that they should have later on in life. Uh, opposite the, <clears throat> the area of, of human good, and we call it human good, is because we recognize, Jesus recognized this. He told his disciples that you being evil... Isn't that interesting? Jesus recognized that at their core, they were sinners and they were evil. These were his disciples. This wasn't the Pharisees. This isn't the Sadducees. He's talking to his, his close friends, the disciples, Peter, James, John, Andrew, all, all the good guys. And he says, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. And that's a recognition that the sin nature can produce relative good. And that's in the area where we're not so easily tempted to sin. The area of weakness is identified as an area of weakness because that's where we easily succumb to temptation to personal sin, to mental attitude sins of worry and fear and anxiety and defeatism and, and uh, all of the negative things there are sins of the tongue, slander, gossip, maligning. And overt sins, a whole host of different overt sins. These are listed in passages like Galatians 5, uh, 18 to, or 19 to 22. So that, that's a basic production level that comes out of the sin nature. And we all tend to trend in one or two directions. And sometimes, if you're really complex, you can trend in both directions at the same time, and you're just a bundle of contradictions. And everybody says, oh, aren't they complex? They're so sophisticated. So if you're like a Pharisee and your trend is towards legalism, then this produces a moral degeneracy. Now, that's an odd term because most people think of degeneracy as something that's immoral or perverted. But morality can be perverted. Just go to a church that emphasizes works salvation. I won't name any denominations. There are churches that emphasize work salvation and cults that emphasize work salvation, and they're moral degenerates. That's the problem that the Pharisees had when Jesus was on the earth. They were moral degenerates. And that emphasis on morality in that culture ultimately led to such a divisiveness that when the, when, the, when the Jews, when Judea revolted, the Jew, you had the Jewish revolt against Rome that began in uh, AD 66, that when the armies of Titus surrounded Jerusalem, the, the, the Jews had, frag, had, by that time in the culture, fragmented into so many different subgroups. You had the zealots, you had uh, various different, you had hyperzealots, and you had other different groups, and there, there were 10 or 12 different kinds of, of groups that had, uh, were, were vying for control. And when the Roman armies finally came to the end, when they were, uh, when, when they were attacking Jerusalem and breaching the walls, these Jewish groups inside the walls were so busy, uh, just as busy shooting and with their arrows and killing and fighting one another as the Romans. It was a complete collapse. That's moral degeneracy. They were, these were all people who held to a high level of morality but it led to such a high level of self-righteousness that it caused such a divi uh, divisiveness within the culture 
that it led to a complete collapse. That's why it's moral degeneracy. Then on the other side, you have people who just uh, want to party all the time. Just let's just have a good time. Let's just sin. Um, you know, we're all sinners. Let's just give rein to our sin nature. Jesus has paid for everything on the Christian version, so it really doesn't matter. We're forgiven. So the blood of Christ, they misquote John, 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. So let's just have a good time. God will, God will uh, we're all going to go to heaven anyway, so it really doesn't matter. So this leads to immoral uh, degeneracy. Licentiousness simply means that uh, it's a license to sin. Lasciviousness means that it gives rein to our uh, baser sexual lusts, and antinomianism is a Greek word meaning uh, a rejection of any kind of laws or standards or rules of behavior. I discovered I needed to explain what these words mean because uh, one day there was a visitor here, and a comment that I was told afterwards were that it's great to see everybody in the congregation has a Bible to look at. I need to have a dictionary. <laughs> so we need to understand what these terms mean. And, and they reflect it. So this is the problem that we have, because if, if it, this is the default position of every human being is sin nature control. Uh, none of us gets away from this. Until you're saved, there's no other option. You're going to sin because that's the only nature that you have. Now, if you're born and you don't have parents who provide discipline and training and teaching as a young child, then there's the only character that's developed is bad character. And it's character that gives rain and free expression, expression to uh, the baser uh, elements and the baser values of a sin nature. And this is seen in Pro, uh, Proverbs 18.1. Uh, a man who isolates himself, that is, away from the values of Scripture and the society, seeks his own desire. And so that's just self, another way of talking about self-absorption. And he rages against all wise judgment. Now, there's so much that you can say about this particular proverb because in the first line, it talks about the basic orientation of anyone who's giving rein to their sin nature. It's, they're living in pure narcissism and self-absorption. Then what's going to happen when they're confronted with truth? This is just an Old Testament version of Romans 1.18, Romans one eighteen and following talks about how the unbeliever rejects the truth and suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Well, this is the self-absorbed person in, in the first part of Proverbs 18. And what happens when they're confronted with wisdom? Well, first of all, they probably don't understand it objectively as, as you intend it to be understood. They just take it as this is somebody telling me I can't do what I want to do. And whenever we, we have somebody preventing us from doing what we want to do, the automatic response to that is always anger. When we don't get our way, we get angry. And so this is what happens here. This is anger that gets uh, multiplied because it, as we continue to push in a particular direction and we're not allowed to fulfill those lust patterns, then the anger intensifies until it's just uh, out-of-control rage. So Proverbs 18.1 emphasizes this, that self-absorption that's given free reign leads to a a foundational emotional orientation of the sin nature of rage and anger. And we live in a culture today that as we see paganism reign in the culture, one of the things that, we, that I drew out of our study of judges many years ago is that a pagan culture gives more and more reign to moral relativism and the reign of the sin nature. And part of what happens is that all the values get, get reversed Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, and eventually that leads to total cultural, uh, cultural fragmentation. And what this produces is a culture of anger, a culture of wrath, which manifests itself in a culture of abuse, whether it's verbal abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, or any other kind of abuse. It goes off the charts because there's no 
character uh, control through self-discipline on the sin nature. Uh, the scripture emphasizes the value of, of wisdom and the value of character. And this is always runs against this base narcissistic value of the sin nature. Let's, we'll look at a couple of Proverbs that emphasize this from the sort of the negative side. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? Now, we're not going to have a show of hands here because none of us are wise in our own eyes, but we all have to deal with people like this on a daily basis. They think they know everything. And, and unfortunately, some people know a lot, but they don't know everything, and other people don't know anything, and they're even more convinced that they have the answer to everything. But that's just a manifestation of arrogance and self-absorption. And the writer of Proverbs says, you know somebody who thinks they know, know it all? There's, no, there's more hope for a fool than for him. Now, a fool is hopeless. So this is an, ex- a, a, an exaggeration here that if somebody thinks they have all of the answers and they're truly self-absorbed, then there's no hope for them. They are so locked into their own uh, self-absorption and self-deception that they'll never come out of it apart from the grace of God. Another example is given in the same chapter in Proverbs 26, 12, that the lazy man is wiser in his own eyes. Notice the similarity a man, in verse 12, a man wise in his own eyes, that can manifest itself as laziness. It can be ethical laziness, it can be laziness in labor, which is what the context is, but laziness can manifest itself a lot of ways. Uh, the lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Now, the writer is using hyperbole or exaggeration here in order to point out the dangers of, of thinking you're wise in your own eyes. Another example is the rich man. The rich man is wise in his own eyes. Now, you would think that somebody who has accumulated a lot of wealth through hard work uh, would have developed a sense of, of humility. You would think that someone who has risen to the top of their profession, someone who is a, an executive in a position of power or authority over a large corporation, would have developed a measure of humility. On this last uh, vacation we were on just a couple of weeks ago, one of the fun things we did at the end, although it wasn't as fun as it would have been if there had been a little more water in the river, was we went on a, um, a whitewater rafting trip on the Rio Grande through the Rio Grande Canyons just west of Taos. And we had a rather um, colorful, interesting uh, river, river guide on the raft with us. But he told us, he was started telling stories about some of the uh, more interesting clients that he had had. And one of them was a man who, uh, when, when he and his wife were go- and children were going on the, on the raft trip, uh, he got in the raft and... Um, the guide was telling him uh, a little bit about the, you know, the instructions, what the protocols, what the rules were for, for operating in the raft. And this guy turned around and said, I'm the CEO of the 14th largest company in the United States. What right do you have to tell me to do anything? <laughs> and he said, well, if you want me to get your wife and your kids safely to the other end of the ri- river in the trip, you're going to listen to what I have to say. But I thought, you know, you'd think that somebody who had risen to the level of CEO would understand that, that he needs to listen to other people who are experts in their field. But when you have a culture that promotes narcissism and self-absorption and gives free reign to this, then they get to a point of success. They think they know it all, and they don't need to listen to anyone. So the rich man is wise in his own eyes, but the poor who has understanding. See, it's not your your economic circumstances, it's your humility. And the poor person can have understanding and a grasp of reality that gives them discernment in all things. That's the point of the second line. Proverbs twenty five twenty seven says, it's not good to eat much honey. I like to paraphrase this personally. It's not good to eat much ice cream, but no. I don't do well with that. It's not good to eat much honey. In other words, don't be self-indulgent. 
It's not good to eat much honey, so to seek one's glory is not glory. Don't be self-absorbed. Proverbs 30.12 says, There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes. Man, that doesn't characterize probably the last three generations in America, the baby boomers, the uh, generation Xers, and the millennials, or whatever else there may be. This is it. There's a generation that's pure in its own eyes. We live in a culture, and we're part of gener- these three generations that think that they are above the law, that they are above ethical standards for the most part. Now, that doesn't apply to everybody, but that is a, a, a general characteristic that holds, holds true. A generation that's pure in its own eyes but is not washed from its filthiness. In other words, what the writer is saying is they think they're right, but they're so wrong, but they're so blinded by their, their self-absorption and their self-deception that they can't see how wrong that they are. That's the problem with pride, is it blinds us to the realities of our own flaws uh, and our own faults. Proverbs 22.15 says, gives a correction. It's, how do you develop character? Character has to be learned from the crib. Character isn't something that, that as a parent that you start teaching when that child is old enough to understand everything you're trying to teach them. I think some parents might wait a little too long to start teaching things like good manners and self-discipline, self-control. I think um, I can remember one time when my parents sat me down and said, it's time for us to start teaching you good manners. I think that might have been a little too late. Not that I don't understand what good manners are or that I'm, you know, some rude country bumpkin, but I think that if you wait till they can really understand it, you're not instilling it early enough, that that's the role of parents, is to start instilling right behavior to teach these 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 core values of integrity and honesty and hard work from as from the crib not and the cradle, not just when they get a little bit older. And it, of course, involves correction. Scripture says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That's because their sin nature reigns supreme, and the rod of correction will drive it far from them. There has to be negative motivation. Now, that doesn't, this is not an authorization for beating children within an inch of their life, although now and then that may not be such a bad idea. I know that in the household where I grew up, it came pretty close to that once or twice, or at least I thought it was. I mean, my dad had a belt that was used for correction, and that came out probably a half a dozen times, maybe ten times over the course of my childhood. And I'm not any the worse for wear for it. But I tell you, just the threat of that was enough for me to straighten up after the first experience with it. Uh, there has to be correction. But harsh correction, corporal punishment, is the last resort. There are a lot of other ways to teach up to that point, but what this scripture is saying is it's emphasizing the stubbornness of self-absorption. That's our base orientation. Those sweet little children that you have and those wonderful little grandchildren that you have are not so wonderful. Scripture says the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things, who can know it? In other words, a, a, a baby is nothing more than a sin nature wrapped up in the flesh. That's a double entendre. You need to understand that. That that really emphasize. They're just they're just it's the corrupt, nasty little self-absorbed things. And it's up to you as a parent to train them to be wonderful, productive, mature adults. That's your job, and it takes energy. You know what I'm talking about. It takes a lot of energy. It takes diligence watching that little nasty thing day in and day out and correcting them a hundred different times in 20 minutes. It demands patience. It demands a real understanding of the role that a parent has in training that child. And that's part of the parental responsibility. 
Now, when we look at Scripture, the Scripture not only emphasizes the negative of self-absorption, but what the correction is. And these are seen in a number of other Proverbs. For example, Proverbs twenty nine twenty three says that a man's pride will bring him low. See, if you want your children's pride and arrogance to destroy them, then let them get away with everything they want to get away with. But otherwise, you need to correct them and teach them genuine humility. The one who is humble in spirit, that is genuine humility, which only comes in some cases from having it drilled into somebody, the humble in spirit will retain honor. If we're living in a self-absorbed, narcissistic culture, the Scripture says that becomes a dishonorable culture, dishonorable people, which is what we have. And, and, our, and our, our government is loaded with these kinds of people. The leadership in the business world is loaded with these kind of people. And the only correction that we have in this country is not just getting people saved, but you have to get people to deal with their sins and their sin nature. It's not just enough to get them regenerate. How many times I hear people say, yeah, well, so-and-so is a believer. Well, that doesn't mean much in this culture. There are a lot of believers who are extremely rebellious and disobedient. Look at some of King David's sins or King Saul's sin. Sometimes I would rather have a a moral, ethical unbeliever than a Christian. We've had a few presidents that have uh, worn their Christianity on their shirt sleeve, yet their character in terms of righteous degeneracy is extremely flawed and has been destructive to this nation. We have to have genuine biblical humility. Proverbs 11, 2 says, warns that when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. We have to, humility has to do with submitting our thinking to the authority of God's thinking. Jesus humbled himself in obedience by going to the cross. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11 emphasizes that he's created, he is God created in the likeness of humanity, but he learned, but he was obedient in the things that he suffered by going to the cross. Proverbs 17, 27, he who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. This is talking about self-control. Self -con there can be self-control and self-discipline on the part of an unbeliever or even a carnal believer, but it's also a fruit of the Spirit that the, God the Holy Spirit produces self-control as part of the of the fruit of the Spirit. I know when I was, I was a Christian by this time, but I was in the, probably the fourth grade or fifth grade, and I wanted my dad's uh, K-bar knife that he had at, when he was in the Marine Corps. And he said that back in those days, they had a, a, a portion of the elementary school report card listed various uh, character qualities, and you were graded with a check plus or minus. And I think in elementary school they assumed everybody got a minus and you had to prove you had, a, you, you know, you, you were good enough to get a check or a plus. So you started off at the bottom and had to work your way up. And he said, if I got a plus in self-discipline three, six weeks in a row, then I would get that K-bar knife. Fifth grade went by, no knife. Sixth grade went by, no knife. Seventh grade, middle school, junior high back then, it was a different grading system. And when it came to conduct, you were graded on a scale of E, G, P, and U. Uh, excellent, good, poor, and unsatisfactory. But the system changed so that everybody starts off with an E, and you have to do something wrong to be downgraded. Well, it was you know one semester, and I had... I had that knife, different system of grading, but I eventually had it. Um, but this emphasis on self-control, parents need to establish some boundaries and some goals in terms of self-discipline to teach children those things. When I was, uh, I think, second grade, I started taking piano lessons. And I had to get up every morning. I had to practice piano for 20 minutes. And then I had my dad designed a little physical workout routine I had to do for 15 or 20 minutes and had to do that every single morning. It taught discipline. And parents need to teach that and instill that. I think they waited too long personally, but uh, 
I think that that needs to come very early on to really get it. it, I tell you, the sin nature is so nasty. It doesn't take long for you to just lapse into bad patterns. So the earlier you can instill that, the better. Proverbs 25, 28, again, emphasizes the self-discipline. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. In other words, there's no defense. Your defense, uh, anyone's defense, against the baser drives of the sin nature is self-discipline, learning to say no to the things that you should say no to. In contrast, a fool vents all of his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Character involves self-discipline, being able to postpone gratification or deny gratification in certain areas in all ways. Now, in the Proverbs, we're talking about ethics and values and virtues that are related to the Old Testament system of spirituality where the Holy Spirit was not involved. And the unbeliever and the believer basically were just in a, in a system of self-discipline. But when we come into the New Testament, we learn for Christians, we move from just character, uh, character values that can be uh, emulated by anyone to specific Christian values and virtues. And this is a, these are identified in passages like Galatians 5, 22 and 23, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there's no law. God the Holy Spirit enhances those moral or ethical values and virtues that we can develop and makes them spiritual virtues and values. This is a result of a previous verse, the command to walk by means of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 16. If we don't walk by the Spirit, then these virtues, these Christian virtues, are not developed in us. But the Christian life is a life of character transformation. God the Holy Spirit is focused on transforming our character from the fallen character that's been the manifestation of the sin nature to the character of Christ. He is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. And when we walk by the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit is constantly working, using His Word to challenge us, to remind us of the truth, to rebuke us, to uh, direct us in terms of the uh, development of these character qualifications. We get a number of other uh, manifestations in Scripture. I'm just going to skip to Ephesians 4.31 and Colossians 3.8. It involves volition. As I pointed out last week, there are some people who get the idea that, well, if I just confess my sin, God the Holy Spirit will make it happen. But that's not what we see in Scripture. We see that there's always that twofold relationship, the work of the Holy Spirit on us and our own decision to do what the Word says to do. In Ephesians 4.31, we read, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking, that's all the result of negative character traits, be put away from you with all malice. Now, the verb there is the one I have on the left in the uh, blue background box. That's an aorist passive imperative. That means it's a command, but it's a passive voice, meaning that we receive the action from outside of us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We're letting the Holy Spirit transform us and remove these things from our life. So we have to be responsive to him. Colossians 3.8 uses a slightly different word, but says, but now you yourselves are to, and it, there's an emphasis there, you yourself, you have to make this decision. The Holy Spirit doesn't decide for you. He will help you in making the decision, but you have to make the decision. You yourselves are to put off all of these. And it's an aorist middle imperative. The middle voice emphasizes that the, the person who receives the action, which is you, also performs the action for one's own benefit. So it doesn't let us off the hook. 
we are to put these things off. We do it under the power of the Holy Spirit while we're walking by the Spirit, but it's not just a matter of saying, okay, I'm going to confess my sins, and then the Holy Spirit's going to make these hard decisions for me. We have to do it. That's how character is developed. We have to study the Word and understand what God the Holy Spirit is doing. It can't happen just on our own. It doesn't happen by magic. It happens by walking by the Spirit day by day with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things today. We thank you for the way that you have provided for us in the spiritual life everything we need and that this is done through God the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word that illuminates our thinking in terms of what our values and virtues should be and understanding that these are ultimately brought about only through that continuous, consistent walk by the Spirit. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning or listening that has never trusted in Christ as Savior, that is unsure or uncertain of their eternal life or eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty for your sins so that that is not the issue anymore. The issue is whether or not you're, ex- you're willing to accept God's free gift of eternal life. Scripture says it's very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, Father, we pray that you would challenge us with the things that we have studied today. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together for our closing hymn, number 198, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Wonderful Grace of Jesus. And then I'm going to ask Bob Beaver if he would please come up to dismiss us in closing prayer. Please stand.
Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your grace provisions for West Houston Bible Church. We thank you most of all for our salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, for the provision of your word in the form of the Holy Scriptures of the Bible, for the provision of our prepared teacher to teach us how to use and apply your word. We pray that all we've done here today honors and glorifies you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.